So with that, I am going to turn it over to Bernice and Jim. Thank you for that good welcome. And yes, we are the Honeyberry Farm. Bernice and I am Jim Ingvaldson, and we are from Bagley, Minnesota, which is near Bemidji and close to Grand Forks, North Dakota. And it's a pleasure to be here today, and I, I feel much at home with this cold, snowy weather. <laughs> and are we going to do the video right away? Well, it's the beginning of berry picking season, and for this week's Northwoods Adventure, reporter Malak Katab visits a berry farm in Bagley and learns that there's different techniques to pick berries. The Honeyberry Farm in Bagley is a you-pick-your-own-berries farm and has been around since 2015. Bernice Ingvaldson, the owner of the Honeyberry Farm, says her interest in opening her own orchard came after seeing an article in a garden catalog. It looked really cool. It was a blue-colored fruit, and it was called Honeyberry, and what attracted me to it is that it did not require acidic soil. We live just outside of the blueberry zone here in northern Minnesota, and... We cannot grow blueberries here without amending the soil. At the farm, visitors can pick from over 40 different varieties of honeyberries. And there's many ways to harvest them. The most common is picking them by hand. And then we have shake and drop where you put it like a something around the plant to catch the berries and then you can shake the, the berries off of the plant and it will drop into your, your catch bins and then we have a machine that also will shake the plant. The Honeyberry Farm also has a mail order nursery. Honeyberry USA was started in 2010 and they take orders all year round. We only ship out dormant plants in April and May and again in late October when conditions are better for transplanting. The Honeyberry Farm also offers other types of berries for people to pick. We have honeyberries in this section of the farm. Uh, then we expanded a mile down the road. We have another three, four acres of cherries and Saskatoons, June berries, some elderberries, and more honeyberries. When you're going out to pick berries, it's recommended that you bring with you a container, but also to dress appropriately. If you have uh, long pants, if you're in areas, if there's any poison ivy or anything like that, um, just um, to be comfortable too, very comfortable. You want to be able to bend and stretch and and uh, not be restricted. It's not a fashion show, you know, outside. Although you can be coordinated. Reporting in Bagley for this week's Northwoods Adventure, Malaka Tab, Lakeland News. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland News, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to Lakeland PBS. So yeah, that tells you a little bit of who we are and. And as Tom Wall pointed out, on a clear day, we can see the North Pole from up our way. And so this is a honeyberry. How many people are familiar with honeyberries? That's good. That's good. So, yeah, it's a dark purple fruit, and, and it is delicious. So today we're going to be talking about the berry and the growing of the berry, the market that we have put together, and the plant itself and some harvesting techniques and netting systems that we have used to keep the birds out. And what is a honeyberry? It is a honeysuckle with wonderful plump blue berries. It's a member of the honeysuckle family Lanacera cerulea, and it, as you can see, it's an oblong berry, and it looks like a mutated blueberry. And the taste of the honeyberry, well, how does it taste? Beyond wonderful. That was the quote of one of our first taste testers in, back in 2012 at a conference in St. Cloud. And as you can see, what we can make out of a honeyberry, we've got a tart there, and we've got fresh eating berries, and we've got some wine. And it tastes amazing, fresh or processed. And it's a mystery berry flavor, a combination of blueberry, raspberry, or grape. And 
and, and everybody seems to taste something different when they taste the berry. And it's amazingly healthy. It's higher in antioxidants, as you can see, than blueberries. And these are some of the things we have made out of honey berries. We've made pie, we've made sauces, we've made salads, smoothies, fondue, waffles, and ice cream. And I, I like to think of vanilla ice cream as, it's just amazing on vanilla ice cream. I mean, a lot of people don't like your vanilla ice cream, it's bland, and they'd rather have something else, but when you put a honey berry on there, it just, it is amazing. And here we come to processing these berries. What we do is we, we freeze the berries, we vacuum seal them, we, we can the berries, we dehydrate the berries, and we ferment the berries. They make an amazing kombucha. And whenever anybody's got a question, feel free to throw it up here. And these are the antioxidant levels of the berries. The Haskat berry is, it's known in Canada as Haskat berry, and in the United States it's called honey berry because most Americans can't say Haskat. <laughs> and so here we have it higher in antioxidants than choke berries, elderberries, wild blueberries, cranberries, blackberries, raspberries, high bush blueberries, and strawberries. And we know when we go to a doctor, they say any. Any fruit that's dark is extremely healthy for you, but honeyberries are right at the top of the list. And here we have a fruit comparison table. And as you can see, Hascap, or otherwise known as honeyberry, is right at the top of all of these different categories. Pomegranate has it beat in potassium, but it's number one in calcium, it's number one in phosphorus, it's up there with the, the iron, vitamin A, vitamin C, and I believe vitamin E, the blueberry has got a little bit higher vitamin E. And so as you can see, the, the tests, it rates, it ranks right up there. Okay, here we have some tea or tincture. It's five to ten times more in nutrients in leaves than berries. And we can harvest the leaf from the time it sprouts to after harvest. And the mildew does usually appear after harvest. And up in our area, we're in the northern third of Minnesota. So we're harvesting these berries in early July. And it's typically the harvest of a honeyberry is typically a week after strawberries, wherever you may happen to be. And then in our area, it's the, generally the last week of June. Does the tea from the leaves have any flavor? No, it does not have flavor. Okay. But it's a, it's a, it isn't going to hurt you to eat the leaf, though. And here we have a look at our orchard. And it's suitable for the home garden, a U-pick or mechanical harvesting on a larger scale. And, and Mostly what we ourselves have geared toward is the U pick and then we we have some commercial we have a commercial aspect of our business where we sell to breweries and wineries. Um with the wineries we've been getting six dollars a pound, six to eight dollars. And are those your seconds or you sort those at all or? that's just that's just a straight run. And we can, we can sell to grocery stores and we get a little bit more, but then we have more, more harvest labor to, to get them to where their food shelf. And here we have the fresh berries. This is the prices we are getting. Yep, you pick berries, we're getting $5 a pound, which is roughly a pint and a half. Pre-picked, $5 a pint. And on a grocery store shelf, five and a half to six dollars a pint. And we have our frozen berries. This is our, more of our commercial aspect of our business. And we're selling to different wineries. We're selling to Tongue River Winery in Montana, Dakota Sun Gardens in Carrington, North Dakota, Forager Brewery, which is in Rochester, Minnesota, Bemidji Brewery, 
And the, both of these, the breweries are making an excellent beer out of this product. And kombucha to a outlet in Wisconsin, some tinctures and some restaurants. And here we have the marketing. The commercial is, yeah, personal contacts. And we've been to food shows and the you pick, which the wife, my wife, Bernice, is very good at keeping up with the, the Facebook and the Craigslist. And we have roadside, roadside signs. Actually, the Minnesota Department of, of Transportation put up two signs for us on our local highway. And we have the local paper, cable TV, as you saw, the first, the first uh, thing there was with the local public broadcasting network. And we do community ed classes and, and our postcards and business cards. And here we have the plant itself. It's good in USDA zones one through eight. And it seems the colder the better. And Iowa is an excellent place for these plants. You guys are cold. And it grows in most soils. The best pH is 5.5 to 7.5. It will, it will grow in other in other, in, in other soil conditions, but these are the optimal. It doesn't sucker. The early varieties ripen, as I mentioned, just prior to strawberries, the end of June in our zone. Later varieties ripen two to four weeks later in zones two to eight. And it's got a 50-year lifespan. And here we have the blossoms and the pollination. The, bum and the, the best pollinators are your bum bumblebees and honeybees and, and your, the hummingbird. And you, and you definitely need two varieties of the honeyberry to pollinate each other. And some, some varieties will not pollinate each other. So here we have the green berries. They grow for three weeks. And then they start turning a little bit of a pinkish color there. But they're not quite ready. Within a day, berry, the berries turn purple. And another day, they turn dark blue. And finally, you have enough, to get the optimal sweetness, you need another two to three weeks to fully mature and fully sweeten so you got those high bricks. And the later harvest, larger fruit, higher sugar, lower acidity, increased anth anthos anthocyanins and polyphenols. But is it ripe enough? And on the table, we've got a refractometer, and that's to measure your bricks and your fruit. And the refractometer measures the soluble solids, the sugars, and your average is the 11 to 16 bricks. Last year, our, some of ours were a little bit shy, maybe around that 10 to 11 bricks. And I think, you know, it's going to vary from year to year. But the best judge is your own taste buds. And we have the yields, which will vary depending on the pollination, the cultivar, and the, and the year. And so you're look, we're looking at one to 10 pounds per plant. And of course, it's going to depend on the age of the plant. The first year when you plant these guys in the ground, you're not going to really, you're not going to see any berries. The second year you start to see a handful of berries and then year after year they increase till about year five to six, you're going to be seeing full, full production. And this particular plant is a honeybee. It's a, that's a variety and it is a earlier variety. And this one was planted in 2012, and by 2017, as you can see, that it had, it had produced nine pounds. And we have our harvest window. Most of the varieties need a week or two for all the blossoms to open. And the weather fluctuations may interrupt the bloom and pollination affecting optimal harvest window. And yeah, we have our harvest window. And, and some of the varieties will hold these ripe berries for well over two weeks. And we, we notice that some of the varieties, they do drop sooner. 
and obviously if one problem we've run on to is some of the some of the varieties later in the year they are we are seeing some mildew with some of the berries the yeah and the berries yep and here we have some different harvesting techniques we as you can see we have a beautiful golden lab dog that has learned how to how to harvest berries <laughs> so what we've got is we've got a we've got a co ground cover like a tarp that we'll put around the the plant and then you can just you can shake the shake the plant and the berries will drop and we've got some excuse me do they all come off at once pretty much if you shake the plant pretty much most of the berries are going to drop off yes yeah, we'll get into bird netting. That's one of our major predators is what the honeyberry is, is birds, yeah. It is largely one harvest, yeah. Yeah, it isn't like strawberries where you've got multiple days of harvest. It's pretty much one and done, yep. Yep. And, so, and also what we, have, what we designed, the guy that's in front on this photo what he had designed a couple of years ago was some we used some plastic construction board and kind of designed a apparatus there that would put on would fit to both sides of the bush and then we could shake the bush and then they drop into the into these containers and then we just and then they're ready to blow off get the leaves off and the debris but here we have some shakers. On the on the right, you'll see an olive harvester, which is, as you can see, it's a thousand dollar for the price of that. But it does an amazing job. It it's it's very easy on the berries. We don't see a lot of damage from from the olive harvester. Actually, no damage to the berries. The, most of the damage will be from actually dropping into, like in this case, you see a swimming pool, a a kiddie pool that we've cut notches in and cut it in half and then that will slide around the around the bush and then on the left you'll see what is actually a reciprocating saw a sawzall and we we kind of engineered a same thing a couple of fingers on there to try to shake the berries off of the bush and it it works very well but you'll see a little bit more damage to the berries when we've been using the sawzall and really the the damage to the berries for what we're doing we're not really geared towards the supermarket quality so we're we we don't really if there's a little damage to a berry we ourselves aren't too concerned about that and in this picture you'll see what is called an indigo supertech waxwing harvester and it's got this framework that will ride above the the entire bush and then it's got the the catch basins which which tip up you've got trays that fit onto the onto the harvester and then the and then the the trays will tip up and right into those smaller trays and this I mean we find that this worked very well but we with our our bushes are quite large so the actual framework didn't work very good and so we ended up just taking the the catch basins and and kind of discarding the framework as you can see those bushes very much outgrew the the waxwing harvester yeah we got some amazingly big bushes and i actually pruned them back this this fall maybe to about Oh, probably about half that size. And once we get the berries shook off of the off of the bush, we take we take we have this slide that we made. It's called a shoot and glow. And what we do is we have a we have a we have a weed blower which will blow the the debris off of the off of the berries as we pour them down the slide and then we'll bag the berries up and 
get them in the freezer. And then initially we just used the leaf blower to remove the, the debris like in whatever we caught it in. But we found that that, that shoot just worked phenomenally well. It was actually a vintage blueberry cleaning shoot that this, that the guy that worked for us had, his family had used it to clean wild blueberries. And this is redneck version one of that shoot and go. <laughs> Just the prototype. And this is, this is version two. And the signboard is very washable. And yeah, because honeyberries are messy. And here we've got a, what do you, what do you call this? Cleaner, Yeah, okay. So it's a commercial har it's a commercial operating some commercial operations freeze berries and suction the debris later we we don't have the facilities to really take advantage of this so we haven't been using it. But they have one for sale. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we do have one for sale. And here we have a commercial harvester, a mechanical harvester. This was this was actually being also used on aronia berries, but this this was at the University of Saskatchewan, and it's called the it's called the Joanna. Does anyone have one here? And this is the Jacoda Jagoda JPS Agro Machine, Jarek Five, and the Oscar. And I don't know much about these because maybe you can. Winter is the time when I get online and do a bunch of Googling and find out, you know, what's been updated. And so I came across this Jarek 5 machine, and the North American distributor is in Alberta, Canada. And he has researched many different, like basically blueberry harvesters in North America. He's looked at the Joanna, and he's settled on this one for his farm. And if you want more information just contact him directly but our farm is too small to really warrant one of this size but because we're in the business I just try and you know keep up to date what is available and uh, make it available to anyone else that might be interested yeah as she mentioned on our farm our our plots are about one acre maybe one and a quarter acres big and and this just it's just too expansive for our our little operation. I mean, I'd love to have something like that, but as you can see, the price of this one here is one hundred and thirty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it's just beyond. It's just beyond our means. Okay, so here we are. We're actually planting with a water wheel planter, and what we do is we lay plastic down, and then we will the water wheel planter punctures holes in the plastic. And probably, if I was gonna do this again, I would probably use a heavier landscape fabric and, and maybe the, and the planter itself probably wouldn't work for, for what we would be doing. But what you wanna find, that what's best is if you have a sheltered spot, because the high winds discourage bees from pollinating and you get a lot more fruit drop when you've got a lot of wind. But full sun is okay in the zones one through five, which is right here and where we're at. But in a more southern zone, you're gonna want some partial shade. But they do, they do grow even here. We've got some in partial shade and, and they've, done, they've done pretty well, but you can tell they're a shorter plant or the where you've got a lot of shade. I think probably because the trees are just taking a lot of the nutrients and a lot of the sunlight. And so also you want that soil pH to be there at 5.5 to 7.5. That's, that's optimal, but as I mentioned, they will grow in, with it not in that optimal range. And the spacing, like we did, 
we got three to five feet between the plants and eight to 12 feet between the rows. And that works good for the U-pick, but if you were gonna be geared towards mechanical harvesting, you would want a wider, you would want more room in between the rows. That's kind of our problem. We can't get the big machinery in there because the rows are pretty tight. And I think if you did have a mechanical harvester, you'd probably want the plants actually closer together in the row. And as far as the timing of planting the plants, you can do it in the spring. As soon as you can dig a hole in the ground, it's good to plant. And in the fall, you can do it until, until the ground freezes up. Uh, how wide is our plastic? I believe ours is 48 inches, I believe. And we've actually got a mulch layer that we lay it down with, so it's so it works real slick. Yeah, yeah the the two year the two year mulch, the plastic mulch, works good for like she mentioned with a, a nursery like us. But if you were if you're wanting this in long term, maybe you might want a little better plastic, as good as as good a heavy plastic as you can get. Our problem up our way is we're dealing with a lot of quack grass. And even this plastic mulch, the stinking quack grass will poke right through it and come up it and come up through it. And here we have different forms of the weed control. And on the left you have actual wood mulch, which we haven't done too much ourselves with wood mulch. I mean, if anything, we've used cardboard a lot. And in the middle, you have a weed badger. And that works, that works phenomenally well. Our first, our first patch, we didn't even put down the, weed, the, the plastic mulch. We just used the weed badger. And, and what that is, you can go around the plant. You can go up the row, and, and that head on there will go in and out between the plants, and you'll keep the weeds away. But you, it's very easy with that to actually destroy a plant too. Yes. I'm wondering, are you seeing many volunteers on your farm who have uh, seedlings coming up and planting it out there? No, we actually, there isn't a lot of, they don't sucker. They don't sucker, but what about the seeds? Oh, no, no. No, we don't see that, nope. And actually, if you want to get them to sucker, you can you can actually get them the sucker too if you want to by burying a branch in the ground. Okay, what happens when you don't water weed your honeyberries, such as this one on the left? Yeah, it's as you can see, they just haven't done well, and there's just a ton of a ton of competition there for them to deal with. Yet, yeah, and these are the same age. And this is what happens when you do water them and when you use things like compost tea and kitchen scraps to get them to grow. And this photo was actually taken near Mentor, Minnesota in a high tunnel. And as you can see, I mean, these plants are just amazing. But, I mean, is, is this a, a good investment to make is to, is to dedicate a high tunnel to a to, to honeyberry plants. I mean, we haven't chosen to do it, and but as you can see, the, the growth is quite amazing in that high tunnel. And here we come up to fertilization. And we actually, our orchard, we've, we actually have never done any fertilizing in, in our orchard, and we've had plants that are shoulder high but but here you have a healthy soil with organic matter and you don't over fertilize with commercial products as i say we have never we have never actually fertilized our plants and some studies indicate better not to fertilize the first year yeah i would agree with that and you want to let the plants go dormant naturally in the fall and you also if you're Doing drip irrigation, I like I do that, and I usually cut off the drip irrigation in mid-August up our way. What's your annual precipitation? 
oh gosh, I think we're probably over 20 inches, maybe 24, somewhere in there. Last year was an extremely wet year, and I actually didn't, I actually didn't drip irrigate my plants after, oh, it was about the 20th of June, I didn't irrigate again. If you were gonna lay them in the plastic mulch, yeah, you would want drip irrigation under there, yeah. Because it does get quite dry under that mulch. But last year, we, like I said, we had such an amount of rain, it just, they thrived even without the drip going. And you can see how now we turn to pruning and we have on the, this picture, a five-year-old tundra plant. And what you want to do is remove 25% of the oldest branches at the base annually after four to five years. Yeah, the first few years don't, don't prune. I mean, that's what we've found not to even bother pruning. And I would say this year, this year was like, what, year six for us or longer? Well, the first one we planted in 2011. Okay. Okay, and this was actually the first year some of our plants got, got pruned, and they were getting quite overgrown. And you want to do a late fall, early winter, early spring pruning. And pruning does lower the sugar and acidity and increases the anthocyanins. And we turn to to mildew, and some, some plants are more susceptible to mildew than others. And the mildew usually starts in the heat of summer after the harvest, and the susceptibility varies tremendously between varieties. And the Russian varieties tend to be earlier blooming and more susceptible than the Japanese. And the plants always do bounce back. I mean, we. We get a lot of calls from people that buy plants from us and it'll be mid-July and they're seeing their, their leaves turn, turn that nasty color and they think the plant is dying and it's, it's not. The plant is fine and it always bounces back. And here we have FOMO, FOMA stem canker and it was detected at the crown level. Consider if there are any ways that mechanical wounds could be occurring at this area of the stem, thus creating an entry point for disease from the University of Minnesota Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Anything you want to add? Maybe when you plant these, when they're rough or something? Okay, so we have, if I can say it, phytophos. Okay, <laughs> that's rut rot. Detected at the University of Kentucky trial in 2017. Yeah, we yeah we don't lose a lot of plants. Two to two to four percent of our plants t typically perish. As far as yeah, we typically lose two to three percent of our plants. Yeah, we don't really necessarily know the reasons. And if someone does buy plants from us personally, we do guarantee the plants that you're going to have a healthy plant or you get a replacement. And here you can see some of the pests regarding honeyberries. You have the tent caterpillar, and we haven't had a lot of issue with that, but an occasional plant here and there, they'll engulf with their little mesh and web and whatever. And in the middle you have the spotted wing drosophila, which will lay a little egg into the, into the fruit, 
and then basically it'll destroy the fruit. And we haven't personally had a lot of issues with spotted wing up in Minnesota on in regard to honeyberries. With our cherries, we get a lot of problems with the cherries. They don't ripen fast enough and the 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 fly basically destroys that that fruit. And deer and rabbits are also a little bit of a problem. We've had to put up eight foot eight foot fence around our around our orchards to keep the deer out. And the main predators of the of it is the cedar wax wings in regard to the fruit. I mean you definitely they definitely do have to be netted. And that's what we're doing right here is to putting on netting, draping in this particular orchard we're draping the we're draping the orchard with, with netting that we've gotten from, from Plantra. And basically to do this it kinda takes about three people. And here we've got a form of of bird netting. Jeff, are you here? No. Nope. Jeff Sindelar did not make it. And here we have another form of netting. This was from an actual customer near Bemidji. And here we have the overnet netting, overhead netting, I'm sorry. And the first year when we did this was kind of a disaster. But you know, we got a big storm like three weeks after we did it and it and we didn't have the we basically did not have the netting put up right and it kind of destroyed a lot and we had to redo some things but but it works good and here we have some different varieties we have the Russian early, early blooming variety and they the leaves are susceptible to some sun scald and you have a nice tubular berry tartar berries and that which adds depth to your jams and I think probably the wine too. And on the right you have the Japanese varieties which bloom a few weeks later and the leaves are most resilient to sun. The berries are very visible which if you're hand picking that's a good thing and they're very preferred to fresh eating. And in the middle you have the Russian Kirill, the Japanese variety. And here we have the geographical distribution, native to northern boreal forests in Asia, Europe, and North America, mainly found in low-lying wet areas or high in the mountains. And breeding has definitely improved the size and taste of berries. We have, on here we have Aurora and Indigo Gem, and probably Aurora is maybe one of our favorite varieties for fresh eating. I mean, it's it is simply wonderful. Where does a lot of the breeding material come from? Is it the university? It's from the University of Saskatchewan in regard to the breeding material. It's from, yeah, the University of Saskatchewan. And then you have Dr. Maxine Thompson out in Oregon, which, which is she aff affiliated with? Her private breeding program. Okay, her private breeding, yep. Dr. Maxine Thompson. And here you have a couple ladies harvesting berry blue. It's a very, berry blue is a very tall plant, six foot wide and six feet tall, and it has a small berry, but they drop very easy, very well. And they're a tart berry. And here you have Dr. Bob Bores, who is the the guy that's basically developed a lot of our varieties at the University of Saskatchewan. And this is the early Russian Aurora honeybee indigo gem. And what would you say about Dr. Bob? He has a nice beard, just like Jim. Feeding the world. That's when he was a student. He's from. He's American, though. Yeah, he's from Virginia, right? Virginia, Maryland. Or West Virginia, Maryland, I think it was. Yep.
given this opportunity to I'm just gonna say yeah, with Dr. Bob, he spent a lot of time in the early years educating people, um, giving seminars, speaking, and really promoting uh, what the Honeyberry was about. And he saw the potential of it. And the Canadians really, uh, well, face it, like we're so limited up there, what to grow. <laughs> so uh, they took it and, and ran with it, and they planted thousands of acres. But uh, thanks to Dr. Bob, who has really related to uh, people very well and continues to do so and promote the berry. And here we have some of the, yes. Oh, what would you say? Yes, yeah, some some will not, and of course, like a later variety is going to be a blooming at a different time as the earlier variety. And here you have some of the late bloomers from Dr. Thompson. The main ones are Solo, Maxi, Kauai, Kaiko, and Tana. And what does Dr. Thompson like to call the honeyberry? Yes. She likes to go by Hascap. Okay. And we have, they have a nice round berry and they are a very upright plant. There is less, seems like there's less foliage with her plants. And here we have our final thoughts. Yes, this berry does indeed sell itself. I mean, once people taste it, I find like 98, 99% of the people really, really like this berry. And some people just aren't going to like tart. But kids love them and... We've, the last couple of years, we've had field trips out to our farm with kids from schools in Bemidji, and they just have an amazing time in an orchard and trying these berries. And we want to give special thanks to our sponsor, the one who has let us do this, and we thank him for blessing us and favoring us with the work we do, and we're very thankful to have been here with you guys today and I yeah I thank you for putting up with me I'm not a public speaker I'm a former dairy farmer and this is definitely out of my realm Can you? I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. My hearing isn't great. Once again. Uh, from the time that your plants start growing in the spring to the time you harvest. From the, that from the time that they start growing in the spring to harvest. Okay. Well, we have whenever the sun comes out and the snow starts disappearing, they can start popping, and it can be anywhere from end of April. That's probably the earliest we've seen up north to middle of May. There's usually probably about a three-week time span in there, depending on the spring, whether it's early spring or late spring. So then it would be the earliest, okay, say, say May 1st, they start blossoming, and then it's a six-week um, time frame before that they're ripe. If they get pollinated May 1st, then they'd be ready middle of June at the earliest. And we are hearing reports that as far as to, to leaf out, like we just got an email a few days ago from North Carolina, and they're already leafing out in North Carolina. They've had a warm, unusually warm time, so but they are expecting cold weather again, and the blossoms are good down to minus 20. But it, we have some trial sites that we you know, keep track of with our, some of our southern customers. And the earliest varieties, we don't recommend to go down there because if they do get that really sharp frost later the leaves can get singed and they'll bounce back but it, it does it is a little bit hard on them so we like to recommend the later blossoming varieties but even so like a warm spell they can wake up too early so it's, it's still kind of an experimental and also depending on individual sites like in general they we've seen they do really well but we can't guarantee that they'll do great for everyone everywhere
Yes, sir. The Berries Unlimited varieties are out of Arkansas, I believe. Yeah. And I initially, uh, yes, they had pure Russian varieties. I think they may have introduced some Japanese variety breeding into them. And our experience is that they we have uh, trialed some of their early Russian varieties, and they are the tubular Russian shape, tartar berry, similar to berry blue, or Czech 17, as it's also known. And they have produced fine for us. Uh, we're looking for, you know, distinctive features. And for you picks, the larger berry is better for us. So that's why we've geared more towards the University of Saskatchewan and um, Dr. Thompson's berries. But, you know, there may be a uh, you know, a purpose for those berries as well, but our focus has been with the other breeding programs. Oregon. She's actually in her 90s, <laughs> and she was a professor at Corvallis, and uh, just loved breeding plants and sailed, focused on the Haskap, and <laughs> so she's licensed in her golden years, she's you know made those selections and gotten them patented, and and uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing what she's done in the in those years. Go ahead. Um, the, so you named like maybe ten varieties out of your favorite ten varieties. Um, do you have a top four that you would recommend? Whichever four I'm eating at the time. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the question, what's the top four out of the ten that were mentioned here? Well, are those ten that were mentioned? Are those your favorite ten? Well, you have, with our uh, farm, uh, we have uh, an approach to have a longer production time so that we can, because we have less manpower, we want to be able to <laughs> stretch our, ma our harvest so that it doesn't all come due at once. So we can have three weeks of harvest, three to four, about four weeks if we stretch it. And then also have the UPIC open for a longer season. If you wanted just to have everything come right at one time and, and only have customers there for one week because you don't want to be bothered the rest of the summer, well, then you would just focus on, you know, two varieties that would cross pollinate and, pollinate and come ripe at the same time. So it's really hard for us to say because, um, they have different characteristics. I kind of like to say, well, which is your favorite child? <laughs> you know, it depends on a lot of things. So, so what we've tried to do is just give the pros and the cons and let, you know, the growers educate themselves and, and decide. As, and as far as selling the plants, we've kind of scaled back some varieties because it just gets to be so overwhelming for the customer to choose as well. So that's part of it. Yes, ma'am. Could you elaborate on community education classes? Is that hands-on? What are community education classes? Well, our local school system, system has a community ed program where in the winter they offer community education classes where anyone can sign up to teach any topic that they want and, and then community members can sign up to take these classes. So I have done this type of presentation um, but more scaled back for the home grower this was really an intensive fast-paced pretty in-depth course for our farmer friends here but uh, I've done that I we also have one called introduction to cold hardy fruits which covers about a dozen different fruits that we grow that people might not know about so and but this year I'm doing something different I'm going to be teaching jamming techniques and looking at different ways to process the berries using low pectin sugar, no sugar, guar gum, other thickeners. So just it challenges me to keep up to date on, on what we can do with the berries and and educate the, the community as well. And hopefully it's free publicity, you know. Basically I don't charge much for the classes and it gets delivered to every household in the county and and it just gets our name out there as well as providing an opportunity for a winter activity for our pickers. Yeah, the main point of those, I think, is to 
build up our UPIC exposure and draw in customers. Some people don't like tart. Which variety is sweeter? I would say it's not that they're sweeter. Well, Aurora isn't necessarily sweeter, but it has less acidity, so it doesn't have quite that pecker power. Tundra. Pretty smooth. The Aurora is a pretty smooth berry. Yeah. yeah. Tundra is also very smooth. It's an early ripener, and it's kind of almost bland because it just doesn't have that pucker, but it's pleasant. It's just mild. Yeah, like one variety we didn't really get into here was Borealis. We have a lot of Borealis growing ourselves, but they're not good for commercial harvest because they tend to bleed when you pick them. And they're really not real good for the you pick because there's a lot of foliage and they're hard to pick. And the Japanese ones actually are a little bit on the, not quite as tart either, a little bit milder. But you let them ripen up, you know, the longer you let them ripen, even berry blue, if you just let it ripen, that early Russian one, it gets, those uh, sugar levels get high enough that, yeah, they're pretty good, even fresh. Let's see. Yeah. With the plant mixture you guys have, is it easy plant propagation cutting? Did you guys do ever plant uh, wood cuttings as well or wooden cuttings? Plant propagation. We're technically distributors. Okay. We do not do propagation due to the, our small size and the number of plants that we distribute. So we purchase um, plants that are t propagated by tissue culture. They'll take a little piece of leaf and put it in a test tube and take care of it really well, much better than we could for a year. And then so we bring down year-old plants from Canada or propagators here in the States, wherever we can, and, uh, and then sell them and also grow some out the larger size we've grown out for a year. Yeah, labor is a big issue for us. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question about um, uh, the UPIC operation. Um, if they change color, but then they maybe don't reach the, the right, maybe they're not ready to be picked for another two or three weeks, so I got that correct. Um, how do you have customers pick the ones that are Okay, since the berries turn blue but don't ripen for another two to three weeks, how do you keep the customers from picking unripe berries? So if we plant all the, the same variety in its own row and have that row cordoned off so we don't allow customers onto that row until we verify that that row is ripe enough. and. I always encourage customers to take a handful because if they take one berry, they might get the last berry that was pollinated and it's not ripe and they'll taste and go, ooh. But if they take a handful, then, you know, they'll have a, a range of sweetness. Or so, no, we can't guarantee. Most of the, our varieties don't ripen all at the same time and it depends. If you've had a warm up, they start 10%, 20% of the blossoms open up and get pollinated and then you get a week of rain or snow or whatever you know it's it's gonna affect the ripening so you, you aim for a happy medium talk to us about netting what do you prefer how long does it last on um, the netting it should be lasting Oh, at least five to seven years is what they're telling us. And as far as my my preference, both of them have good points, and both of them have not as good a points. The stuff that we the stuff that we drape, you can get some birds that kind of get caught in there, and and they can kind of get under the under the netting, and so that's a negative to that. And the overhead netting a lot of positives in the sense that we pretty much are keeping all the birds out but it takes like we have two two plots that are like three quarters of an acre each and it's a good oh it's a good two to three days to get the netting put back on there every year but otherwise we really like that that overhead netting a lot yeah, 
We personally have not put up like the hoops that you saw. Those come from other orchards and they're on smaller plants. Our bushes are bigger. And frankly, the 17 foot width is, we haven't kept them, our plants pruned down small enough. So it's more, when we drape the netting, it's a deterrent to the birds. And it also helps us keep you pickers you know, indicate <laughs> what's been picked and what hasn't. And so, yeah, we just tell them, if, uh, pull it back and then pick. Otherwise, you know, if it could be a free-for-all and you don't know who's picked what. And when do you put it on? Did you also have a question? Oh, yes, thank you. When do we put it on? Uh, we usually try to put it on when the berries are still green. Because even the, even like the green berry, the, the birds will still eat the green berries too. They, the soil type has not had a, any kind of a bearing on what we ourselves have been planting. Okay, what is suckering on berry plants? Suckering is when it sends out a long root or rhizome or underground branch underneath as the case may be, and then you get plants popping up 10 to 25 feet away. So if you're in town, you do not do not want to plant something that suckers along the fence or your neighbor might not be happy. Um, but so these are ideal for planting along your fence because they do not sucker. When you say, okay, are honeyberries high in tannins? And that is of great interest to winemakers, I believe, right? Are you interested in making wine? Well, honeyberries, I think, mm -hmm. are great, but, but you've got to process them because they're so high in tannins. Mm -hmm. eating that tannin, they're not... Yeah, aronia berries are quite um, strong because of the tannins for fresh eating. Honeyberries, we eat them out fresh off the bush, no problem but they do make good wine. So I'm not sure on, on the exact level of the tannins, but there's pucker power, but it's not a dry, it's it's very juicy. The The honeyberry is, it's like explodes in your mouth when you bite into it because it's so juicy and, and it does not have that dry mouth feel afterwards. Yeah, the honeyberry wine is kind of a fruity, fruity sweet wine. And I mean, we like it a lot, but what I really liked was when we, mixed we've been making our own wine at home too and what i really liked is we mixed it with a king of the north grape which is probably quite acidic and by itself it's really it's a terrible wine but when you mixed it with the the honeyberry there was something about the two of them that just complemented each other amazing and i thought it was the best wine i've had pretty much in my life Excellent question about pollination, she asked, so I will tell you. Each honeyberry has two parents, a male, well, they're not male and female, but they have, um, they need two different kinds of honeyberries to cross-pollinate, like apples, you need two different varieties to pollinate, and the biologist can tell you the, you know, the facts of life about that, but, so you have the two parents, and then that produces a berry, and... Um, okay, so those two parents should not be related. It, we have the indigo series, indigo gem, indigo, indigo treat. There's a, one called indigo yum as well up in Canada. They all came from the same parents. They came off the same bush, so they're siblings. So they are not very good pollinators for each other because they have the same parents. So even though they're, they're different enough to be called different varieties, well, cultivars, actually, different selections. They really aren't the greatest pollinators. So you want bushes that have different genetics and bloom at the same time. Does that answer your question? How do we find out what they are? Are there nice charts about this? There's a chart on our website. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
the University of Saskatchewan has a good chart. Your local garden catalogs, just last week I saw one selling Indigo Gem and Indigo Treat as a pair. They're siblings. The University of Saskatchewan does not recommend them for cross-pollination because they are too closely related. But in general, it's basically the Indigo series, Indigo Gem, Indigo Treat, Indigo Gem, and Tundra, and I think Borealis is in that category as well. Well, anyways, if you s they're all related, and they're early to mid bloomers. So that group from the University of Saskatchewan, you don't you want to plant something out of that particular group, but that particular group will pollinate everyone else. So it's basically <laughs> I think everything else out there is probably you don't have to worry about because um, it's genetically diverse, but that initial family of five that was released from the University of Saskatchewan, they said, well, you need a, a pollinator, a pollinizer, and they called Berry Blue a pollinizer because it had a long uh, blo bloom time and it would was compatible. The blossom was genetically different from that cluster of university bred plants, so, but actually anything can be a pollinizer to each other. It's and if, um, yeah, so it's just basically those that you have to watch for, but other than the bloom time. The Thompson's um, late bloomers, they should cross-pollinate with the University of Saskatchewan late bloomers as well. Breeding work for an ever-bearing variety, I have not heard of. Another Are question? They Pardon me? Are they oh, how expensive are they? Well, the more you buy, the cheaper they get. <laughs> and we follow the same policy as, well, when I first discussed getting some plants from Jim, uh, he said, well, how are you going to pay for them? So I said, I'll sell some. Now, I didn't know we needed a nursery license to sell plants at that point, but, <laughs> um, but the idea is that I got a group order together and then the price came down. So we offer that to our customers as well. Tell, you know, get a group order together and we'll be happy to drop the price for you. It, it, they, range, they can range from older plants, $30, down to... Um, Typical price, fifteen to twenty dollars per single plant. Well, you need two for cross pollination, but then the more you buy, the cheaper it, w it will get. Our website, Honeyberry USA. We put our brain on the website. We pretty much share everything we know because it helps us remember. And also, um, I figured if if I was curious about something, that someone else would want to know the same thing. So it, it's out there. And we'll stick around. You're welcome to stick around. We can actually move to another building or another room here around the corner, and we'd be happy to continue the discussion. We have more videos. If you want to see videos or anything else, pick our brains some more. We'd be happy to continue.